okay, so I guess everybody got a chance to say something if they wanted to say something or share something. Um, so I'm kind of done because the goal was to demystify machine learning and you guys demystified everything so <laughs> I don't have to do anything. We have all these definitions now. So the truth is I don't have answers either and uh, I think all of those are uh, good and I think there's some variation in what some people believe. Uh, let's, let's discuss a few. So um, machine learning, um, I guess there is some some topics around machines and algorithms on one hand and there is a little bit statistics on the other hand and um, in some people the machines are okay so the machines are optimized but they're not too smart i guess not as <laughs> uh, okay so so I guess there is the field of statistical learning, which is like the very traditional statistical uh, way of learning. And, but a lot of the machine learning methods we've seen, they not all of them are entirely statistical, right? A lot of them have like a lot of hacks and kind of ideas, like kind of uh, looking at geometry and so on. So in some sense, it's always a little bit more than statistics and it's some sort of algorithms, but it's not just like very like, uh, procedural algorithms. Usually they try to find some pattern. Um, that's at least my version of what machine learning is. And um, on, that, uh, on that topic, I think sometimes it's good to go back into the history and read a little bit about how these fields um, kind of appeared um, and uh, what, was the, what happened in those moments. And for that, I think one, uh, one good paper to read is um, uh, statistical modeling, uh, the two cultures. Who has heard about this paper? Have people heard about it? So basically this, I'm just gonna summarize it very quickly, but uh, you can kind of read, I have these references for you. But it a little bit discusses the time when uh, kind of uh, statistic, statisticians were trying to do data analysis, but I think a lot of their methods were based on models. And in this paper, uh, the author argues that, you know, there's this new uh, way of, solving these problems by having um, methods which don't have an explicit model. So this is more about the black box algorithms. So that's uh, something kind of that uh, he discovered in industry in those days, and he tried to bring it back to the community. So it's, uh, it's a good paper to read in terms of this, maybe the kind of appearance of machine learning <laughs> field versus statistics. Uh, okay, let's look at one some other topic so data science intersection of a lot of fields and some domain knowledge uh, a fancy term for what we all do i agree that's my job <laughs> and i'm okay with that um and um okay so more of an uh, umbrella term but uh, not kind of involving a lot of the other things. Statistics, um, data analysis, quantitative methods, math. Um, I guess to me statistics is, you know, like the science of making infer inference from data, which is uh, a lot what we all do. And on statistics, I'm gonna share uh, this book, The Lady Tasting Tea. Anybody has heard about it? Anybody has read it? Um, uh, so this book kind of gives uh, the history of statistics in uh, 19th century. Uh, and um, I think it, you kind of understand what happened and why things are now like that, kind of looking through this history, but you also understand how really all the things that you're using now uh, you know, they're created like in like a short period of time. So there's like a big, um, big advances in statistics. And uh, the other cool thing that you learn is that you, you'll be amazed that some of the first data scientists were back in those days. 
and they are really like trying to kind of the the reason statistics was developed because um, people were actually trying to solve real problems in agriculture and so on. So it's kind of interesting to to read it there and see how uh, people were motivated. Uh, Guinness was one of the uh, big statistical centers because they wanted to optimize the taste of the beer, for example. So another book I recommend. Um, okay, artificial intelligence. Something smarter than machine learning, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, but the, I think one of the things with artificial intelligence is that if once it's already achieved, it doesn't look as uh, impossible that anymore. So what we thought it's not possible uh, became possible, and then it's not that artificial intelligence anymore. Okay, deep learning. Um, I guess, I think here people are more consistent about using neural networks uh, and deep neural networks. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. Okay, so let's, let's, um, let's, so my main point is that actually names don't matter. I don't care personally about the names. Uh, what we should care is about the problems that we can solve. And if we can use tools from different fields, that's perfectly fine. We, we can just um, use whatever names we want as long as we solve the problems that need to be solved. And uh, in terms of problems, I think kind of uh, within machine learning, there's a few categories of problems that people uh, try to address. Some of those are of supervised learning where you have, um, you have some data and some labels and you try to make inference from those labels. Uh, you have unsupervised learning where you try to find some patterns in your data. Uh, you have semi-supervised learning where you have uh, a little bit of labels but not enough and you have a lot of data that is unlabeled. And you have reinforcement learning uh, where you don't really have uh, labels but like there is an agent which explores the environment and you get awards uh, uh, from that exploration. So you learn in a slightly different manner. So I think these are kind of the main categories uh, that uh, um, people try to categorize the machine learning problems in. And we're gonna discuss today supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And um, this is kind of uh, following the same uh, um, So this was a graph that was created in 2013 uh, and kind of it's a roadmap of trying to make decisions about solving uh, these problems. And some of them are um, like regression and classification fall in the, in the category of supervised learning. And clustering and dimensional reduction fall in the category of unsupervised learning. And there's a lot of things that are kind of on the edges, but that's, that's fine. They're very interesting problems and we care about them. It's just, it was sort of simple to group things this way. And this path kind of walks you through some advice of how to approach your problems using the scikit-learn library. So in some sense, it's a little bit biased because maybe there are algorithms that were great, but they are not in the library. So, uh, but I think it still kind of uh, gives like a good, uh, a good path of the landscape uh, of the methods at that time. So I tried to make these and then I realized they, they look very retarded, but I decided to put them in because I spent my time to, <laughs> to make them. But anyway, I tried to simplify, but I think uh, we kind of just to make sure that everybody kind of understands the, 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 these individual problems. So classification, we have data and we have labels. And uh, so there is like basically the methods, machine, whatever we call them, uh, are trained on this data and these labels. And once the method is trained, um, then we need to do testing. So we basically, we have, uh, we generate uh, from the data, we generate new labels that are predicted labels. And we also have labels that are uh, the correct ones. So then we can evaluate the difference and basically say whether an algorithm is good or not. So this is kind of the main framework 
So we should kind of always remember that this evaluation step uh, should be there. Sometimes we run a few methods and we kind of just plot some results, but we actually have to evaluate uh, things properly. Regression, same thing. The only difference is that uh, our labels are now values. So they could be like, they don't need to be uh, uh, categories. So they could be uh, any sort of dimension and we need to evaluate things in the end. Um, clustering, so we get the data and we try to cluster it in several um, categories. Uh, we don't have the categories in advance. Um, so usually we use some sort of distance to find patterns in the data. So a lot of the clustering methods rely on some uh, idea of what distance is between your observations. So sometimes we think this is hidden, but uh, it affects your method. So it's good to check what are the assumptions on uh, distances. And uh, although there are a few ways to evaluate clustering um, methods, uh, trying to see whether the clusters are robust, a lot of it is kind of human uh, driven. So we kind of look at the clusters and say whether they look, they make sense to us. So it's a little bit harder to evaluate cluster, clustering uh, algorithms. Same thing with uh, dimensionality reduction methods. Uh, if the goal is to find patterns, it's a little bit harder to say in advance whether these patterns are meaningful. We can always do good approximation with, in, with uh, some transformation of the data. We can measure that. But whether these patterns are meaningful, you most probably will look at that. So that's a little bit unfortunate. And it also relies on distances. Uh, so although it's sometimes hidden in the algorithm. Okay, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time for uh, reinforcement learning. Um, okay, so let's now discuss um, some examples in oceanography. And uh, I have a few, but after that, uh, I would be happy if you share um, some uh, that you have. So the first one is an example of classification. And there is a team, quality control team, who is actually working on machine learning for quality control. Um, so this is a, an older example, but in this case, the, the data was labeled. So um, though they couldn't get only two categories, good data and bad data, they actually have several kind of intermediate categories. And then you have a set of features uh, which are some physical features, and uh, the algorithm tries to predict from these features whether the, we have an outlier or not. You can put way more constraints in this approach than a just generic uh, um, classification, and actually in the paper that describes this method, they actually had some domain knowledge that was incorporated, so it wasn't like a, a black box algorithm. Um, example for regression, I think, a lot of you have worked or at least have seen some algo data. And one of the typical things is that algo data comes uh, at points, but we kind of care about the spatial information. So usually there is a step of, um, in some sense, interpolating uh, these points to, uh, to space. But actually interpolation can be rewritten as a regression problem. So. Uh, interpolation is the geometric formulation of the problem, and you can have an equivalent statistical formulation, uh, which is regression. So you basically try to predict the missing data. Um, and you can see that in this example, that those two are kind of different. So, so this is something to keep in mind that uh, sometimes they share these products um, and you kind of get it as a ready product and you start your work from there. But you should uh, think that, um, you should remember that there is an uncertainty associated with these estimates. So you should ask them back for the uncertainty uh, of their methods. Otherwise you propagate this error through all your methods going forward. And in this example, uh, in a recent paper, they actually tried to incorporate spatial and temporal information for this regress. Okay, and this is an example that a lot of you have seen. Um, uh, PCA of um, surface temperature. 
And just depending on the language, uh, people call it PCA or EOF, empirical orthogonal functions. So it's the same thing, and it's a method from years way back uh, that we still use over and over again. And an example of clustering, this is slightly different. It's a gene clustering, uh, and it's a hierarchical clustering. So you can kind of discover uh, links in your data uh, through some, uh, usually you need some distance in order to do that. So, so I'm curious now if you can share um, uh, some applications that you have seen. So this, I, I wrote it that we do it in later part, but I think it's better if you just kind of share uh, a few examples that are interesting from um, any of these categories of using machine learning in your domain. Yes? Okay. And uh, it was kind of, uh, it worked out well. Yeah, uh, we had a really smart thing with that. Oh, okay, okay. So you, from one variable, you predicted the other one, which was parsing. Okay. Any other examples? I'm sure there are other examples. Okay. So yeah, regarding scapes, like I've seen seascapes, soundscapes. Uh, so people try to process different types of like spatial data, sound data, um, and kind of find patterns uh, automatically from the basically what happens every day. Uh, yes. Okay, and like when you did you look at some uh, interpretability of this model because it's trying to relate to some physics of that or it's too hard? At least some variables that mattered. Did you? Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Um, any other examples? Um, so I guess for the ones who have tried to use machine learning, they must probably have encountered that sometimes the machine learning libraries try to expect the data to be in certain format and ocean data is never in that format. And, you know, it's very, data can be very heterogeneous, uh, like it's a different resolution, different length. And so it's not like your data comes 
So like a lot of um, expectation in general, like our, your data comes in a table where you have a feature in the column and observation, kind of like as if we are records in a, in a database. But in reality, things don't really come like that. So usually we have to spend a little bit time thinking how to put this, uh, as we said, we have a lot of like spatial temporal data and we have several different components and different resolutions and so on, to put it really into the right format first and second to make sure we don't do something wrong because the main assumption is that a lot of methods assume that these features are independent and we know that nothing in the ocean or in the whole um, ecosystem is really independent so it's a little bit of tricky part okay so then uh, i guess one question is like can deep learning solve that or didn't they already solve that because they solved everything so to some extent, I can say that they do help a little bit uh, with uh, uh, allowing to process data that is not in a traditional format. Yes. Um, yes. And close. Okay, so this is my quick kind of uh, additions, because now we're 2019 and that graph was made in 2013. And uh, the graph was geared a little bit to like uh, kind of data sets which are organized in terms of features and uh, observations. And I added a few things, although like, you know, this is sometimes when we make these guides, uh, we should be careful so that we don't mislead people. And I still think people should check kind of try to have a better understanding of what's going on as, as opposed to following the uh, decision tree. But I just tried to add a few things that where I think uh, 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 advances have been made. And uh, I think particularly when data is spatial and temporal, um, we have seen a lot of advances in the last years. So, in the, so, so now a lot of uh, cases when we encounter spatial and temporal data, which could be like images, it could be uh, text, um, we can actually resort to some deep learning methods and um, kind of make progress in that direction. Before it was pretty hard because you had to come up with these features and um, it was, they're kind of heuristic, so it was tricky. So also I've seen a lot that in the past people were trying to solve the problems, but now they just say, well, just go get more data. So it's a little bit uh, of this attitude. So like, you know, like it's, it's always more, it's gonna help, just go get more data as opposed to thinking deeply about the problem that uh, you're trying to solve. And it kind of works sometimes getting more data help. So uh, that's, uh, that's what I've seen. So, and this we see in classification uh, for, uh, we have seen in, um, in regression and um, in for, for specifically for, um, uh, so like a lot of deep learning is uh, written as like supervised learning problem, but we have seen some advices even on the unsupervised learning side where people have from labels, they have generated now good ways to encode your data. So even if you get new data, you can just use these encodings. And then once you transfer your data into this new format, you can cluster them without having any labels. So there's kind of different areas where uh, we have seen advances. Okay, so we'll get later more into the deep learning, but for now, I still think that uh, we should all know how to do machine learning uh, in general, because deep learning is just type of, kind of just uh, a set of methods, but there are so many methods. So it doesn't really matter what methods you use, you should know how to evaluate them and um, understand them. So we'll jump now into uh, an example, which kind of the whole tutorial is using uh, uh, data sets, uh, which is uh, containing um, uh, audios from uh, well calls. And um, so this was, um, there, there was a challenge uh, a few years back uh, where it was like a classification challenge and they organized these data sets so that people can uh, uh, compete in detecting well calls. And I'm using this data set 
uh, not because of like my goal is to really show you how to detect well codes because uh, the methods I'm using are not even the best methods that you can use now. For me, it, the goal is just to walk you through a problem where you just get a data set that's less typical than the standard data set and kind of walk through the process of what we need to do with this data set because maybe your data set is also slightly different. So if you're like a, a actual marine scientist, don't use that as the best, uh, you know, like a way to detect um, well calls. And if you're from some other domain, don't take this as like, oh, I don't care about well calls. I don't care about this tutorial. Because the goal is just to kind of walk, kind of transform the data and uh, do something with it. Okay, so, and to get started, so I just want to get a sense like, how many people have done uh, some something with machine learning in Python? Okay, a few of you. Uh, how many people have done some um, deep learning? Okay, so I think the first part would be maybe like a little bit like traditional and maybe simple for the people who have already done this stuff. Uh, so, but the goal is that everybody can try it and get a sense of how to do this and then we'll kind of get more into uh, some little details. Okay, so we'll, we need to go to the notebook that's called data loading. So this is just a notebook in which I, I have to load the data. So, um, but kind of um, to just show you what we have. So we actually have a um, set of, so if we go to data, we have a set of files which are in a special format, which is AIFF. I didn't know about this format before, but luckily Python has a library to read the sound files. And uh, we have uh, labels uh, which say that whether each file contains a right whale upcall or not. Uh, and uh, this is what they shared way back and people competed to have the best solution to solve this problem. So, as usual, uh, sound comes, uh, uh, sound is a little bit hard to deal with uh, when it's in raw data. So let's, let's go through these first steps of this notebook, uh, which are just looking at all the files. There are 30,000 files, but we want to use all of them because I'm a little bit worried that we're gonna overwhelm the, the server. So let's hope things are okay. So, and we can read the labels. And the labels are in this format. So we have the file name and the label. So zero, no call, one call. I listen through these files and I'm almost confident that um, there are actual calls in a lot of these files that have zeros. And that makes the problem challenging because uh, there's a lot of other well, so it's not just classifying, uh, you know, um, uh, animal sound versus no animal sound. So it's you have to figure out exactly what uh, the right well and the right call is. So it's a little bit trickier problem than uh, you think. So like for example, so this is an example where there is so number six. Uh, you see it's uh, one and it has a call and these are just a few steps to read it you don't have to look for those steps so this is how the raw data looks like and as you can see it's kind of using these data directly it's gonna be harsh right because it's uh, very noisy but when we listen to it um, when we listen to it I'll try it one more time. So you can hear it. So so your ear can can detect the sound, but it's very hard to detect any sound from the kind of from just looking at the signal, right? And interestingly, I check those and uh, one which says has no call. So let's oh, yes. Uh, yes. Let me hide this. Let this be there. Okay. And how do you make full screen? Okay. 
Egypt for I doubt it's necessary. Oh. Okay, so I'll try to just make small short small snippets. So this is our data. And here, this is just useful thing to know. Uh, if you wanna play a audio file in your notebook, you can do it uh, using this uh, audio function from the display, from kind of the raw uh, functionality of the notebook. And all you need to do is you need to put this signal is a NumPy array. So as long as you manage to read it, which I use these libraries to read it and put it into a array, then you can actually read your, uh, uh, you can play your sound. So this is just something that you might find useful in general. And if I swap this with number one, um, let me find it. I lost, I lost something. I think I somehow deleted something by mistake. Okay, here there was some bullshit. I destroyed a line. Okay, so now I'm reading a file which has no sound based on what the label says. And I, I'm 100% sure I hear the same thing. So, so this, is, this is something coming with real data. Then there's the question is like this was annotated by people. So there is option one, these people are really experts and they could distinguish these two types of whales. Uh, option two, these people were too tired annotating and could not hear anything anymore. <laughs> so, but that's something to keep in mind. So there is a little bit contamination in this data set, but this is just something to keep in mind, which um, when you're trying to uh, run any machine learning algorithm and you say that your labels are ground truth, you should ask yourself, are they really the ground truth or not? Uh, but anyway, we'll just kind of uh, use it as it is. Okay, so now we have this data and can we discuss a little bit uh, what can be done with this data so that we can uh, put it in a more useful format? Any suggestions? Uh, sorry. Some. So spectrogram is one option. Uh, why, uh, how does the spectrogram help us? Yes, great. So like kind of the, the most important thing in this mess is the frequency information, but we kind of lose it just by looking at it, right? So the spectrogram can help us. Um, what, other, what, what other options are there? Any other options? Uh, filtering, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Uh, do you know any filters that could be useful? Or if we kind of expected uh, a call to be like a spike or something, then um, then maybe that could even like detect it kind of above some threshold or something, or like at some frequency, like high frequency. Uh, actually, these, I, I, I think they appear in specific range and uh, marine biologists know in what, uh, within what frequency they, they can expect uh, these sounds, so that can help them. Uh, any other options? So spectrogram seems pretty, spectrogram and filtering. So the Fourier method seem to be the most powerful in this case, right? Uh, yeah, and I think sometimes people try to using either filtering or spectrograms, they try to come up with extra, to kind of build features from them so that they get to that table that we are talking about. So they can look at the power spectrum, like the 
uh, the total power spectrum or um, some sort of um, um, kind of pitch and so on. So like things from, uh, from sound. Uh, okay, so what we'll do is we will calculate uh, the spectrogram and I'll just go quickly through it because this is not, doesn't matter for the problem. And what are the dimensions of a spectrogram? We said we have frequency and time, right? Um, so, so it looks, so we can see an up call here. So we see the pattern. Uh, but what do we do with it um, kind of in order to, to use like some of these traditional methods? As I said, a lot of them are, they just want a vector. So one of the simplest options is to really make a big vector out of it. Um, is it a bad idea? Is it a bad idea? What do we lose? Do we lose things or it's okay to flatten this thing into a long vector? We kind of lose some of the patterns, right? The spatial relationship, but at the same time, things are arranged in the same place. So there is some hope that uh, some things get preserved. So it's not the, so although it sounds really bad, it's not the worst thing to do. Like a lot of times people have very complex spatial, spatial temporal data and they just make a big vector out of it and try a method uh, that can work on vectors. So this kind of violates all the assumptions about uh, independence, but then a lot of methods are robust a little bit to your features being dependent. So it's not, it's not too bad, uh, but clearly there is more to do if you want to use the spatial information. Okay, so for the first, for the first experiment, we, we're gonna get only 10,000 just so that it's not all of them. And uh, I'm gonna go through these functions which are just gonna build uh, a spectrogram for each, uh, for each uh, sound and we're gonna store it. Uh, we're actually gonna store it as a long vector, which I know it's just easy to do, but maybe we will stuff, we'll check later. Okay, so. I'll go through these cells because it's not that interesting, but the main thing is that in the end, um, I have observations and I have one vector of the values. So, okay, and we'll save them so that we can actually read them in the other notebook. <laughs> so, so we'll just store them as X and Y. Why are the labels? So we really turn these sound problem into like a traditional, you know, like predicting Y from X problem. Does it make sense so far? Okay. All right. So I'll just go to the other notebook. This is just kind of, we just store them. And um, what would you use to speed up this operation? Yes, question. Um, so what I did is, um, uh, so the question was what really, uh, to explain a little bit what happened when I said I converted the spectrogram to a long vector. So I actually use this function Ravel, which basically takes the two dimensional array and just stacks it each column one under the other one. So in the end you have a long vector. So I, um, basically violated the dependence in, uh, in time. And it's kind of, uh, basically I treat them as independent values. So it was, uh, let me go. Let me go. I think you uh, so yeah, like basically, uh, let me show you the dimensions. So this is the spectrogram here, just an example. So, so the dimensions are, it's, it's, uh, it's square, right? Because it contains uh, time and frequency dimensions, okay? So when I do uh, Ravel, 
and I look at the shape of the output, I basically get a long vector of stacking all these columns. Um, so it's one way to deal with uh, arrays and we clearly, we don't capture some of the spatial information, right? Which we're gonna come back to that, but for now we just do that, okay? So, so yeah, the length of this, the number of features now it's 7,611 features and they're very meaningless features, right? Because each feature is a pixel in the spectrogram, okay? So, so how can we speed this up? Let's prosper up. Most probably we will be slow if we have tons of files. What did you learn so far? Uh, what from Dask could you use to speed this up? There are several options. Making it parallel, what function could you use for that? <laughs> Anybody remember? Well, dusk, but it's a sub function. Delayed. So that's one option. Then you're just gonna have this function, uh, maybe create spectrogram function, and you can make it delayed. Then you can pass it, uh, you can run it on the cluster. Any other options? From dusk. Okay, let's limit it to dusk. Uh, any other ideas? So dusk also has. Uh, uh, fast Fourier transforms built in. So you could possibly try to, one option is to just parallelize the, each, the computation of each spectrogram. But another option is to speed up each individual spectrogram creation. So using the Fourier transforms from that could be one option. Okay, uh, this is slow, it's not optimized. So anyway, let's go to the, to the next notebook. So in the next notebook, we'll, for a second, we'll, um, uh, we'll uh, not use the labels and we just wanna explore this data set we just got and we wanna see what patterns are in this data set and see whether we can find something. And, uh, okay. So we're gonna go to dimensionality reduction. So we said the data set, uh, we have 7,000 features and we also said they're very meaningless. Once we put it in a vector, they become more uh, meaningless, right? It was meaningful when we look at it as a picture. So what do we do in this case? Well, it's a large dimensional, um, uh, vectors so we maybe can do some dimensionality reduction to find some patterns and I think uh, for this I suspect more most people have seen some version of PCA analysis so uh, I'll just quickly kind of walk you through how you do it in Python um, so do people understand PCA or EOF conceptually so you look for uh, you have a data set uh, you have a set of observations and you're looking for the directions of most variation within this data set. And then you can project your data on those directions and hopefully those patterns that you uh, uh, can see are meaningful and you can kind of uh, say something about your data. I would not go into the map, I'll just kind of show you how to do it in Python, more of operational uh, way of looking at your data. Okay, so we load some functions. And let's see what the, the graph says. Well, the first thing to do is if you look at data, they say to look at PCA. It's been there for years and it still works pretty well. So let's, let's just do that. Um, in Python, um, the uh, several decomposition functions go under the scikit-learn decomposition uh, module. So you can, um, you can look at it and you can see this is not the only option.
So we actually have a bunch of methods um, and I don't know what, which ones are popular within your domain, but I think the main ones that are most famous are um, ICA, independent component analysis. If you, in, in time series analysis, sometimes people use that method. Um, and uh, NMF, non-negative matrix factorization. Um, and some dictionary learning methods. So I think this is kind of uh, a few ways to um, decompose your data. Latent Dirichlet allocation is useful for text analysis, so it's kind of different. Um, but we'll use PCA. And to do that, it's pretty simple. So uh, you first kind of uh, set this object. So you basically, you set up um, PCA that you're gonna take 30 components. And I'm asking also to make, uh, to make the copying happening right away. This is, you don't have to do that. Uh, it can save uh, a little bit of memory if you just update your arrays on the fly. Um, but um, you can also do it without it. And then, so I get this set up PCA and then I just um, apply fit transform to my data set. In this case, I locked my data set for whoever has worked with spectrograms. Uh, they know that usually it's uh, good to, to first apply a lock transformation to them. Um, and my format of X is, as I said, it's number of uh, basically columns are features and the rows are observations. So this is important because if you flip it, you kind of get uh, your interpretation kind of flips too. So you should always uh, uh, align it in the right way. And then if we look at the shape of X transformed, yes. Um, yes, because uh, I'm an oracle and I went forward first to check how many I should go. Uh, and um, in order to find the number of, um, kind of a good number of components is to look at the eigenvalues. So first thing, what we can do is we don't know. So we can always uh, specify some, uh, we can actually, maybe can we even leave it? I, I don't know. If we do. Yeah. So I think if we do it this way, uh, we would just use all of them. So we'll basically find uh, the decomposition of our data without losing any, any information. And then we can decide how much we want to cut off. Um, so, Maybe it was slow, so I cut it out to 30. Um, but, um, but in general, like what people do is they look at the, at the eigenvalues and they plot them and they look for the elbow pattern in that plot and approximate kind of the number of uh, components uh, using that approach. Uh, I always go a little bit kind of further than the elbow to make sure I don't lose information. So the corner might not be the best thing. Uh, it really depends what you do. Sometimes you might be just doing approximation and you might be fine with two components or you maybe just want to visualize things in 2D. So then uh, you could go even uh, with a very small number. It depends on the application. So for now, we're just kind of looking, right? We are not really predicting anything. So we're just gonna uh, select a, a good number that we can um, obtain. So let's look at uh, the singular values. So now that we computed them all, um, you see that this is the elbow somewhere here. It's hard to see, so I, I will zoom in so that I can see um, where, where it is. So maybe I'll show the first 100. So, so yeah, I kind of, I pick the number where it starts with the plot hole. Um, but most probably you can capture a lot of information. And you can get this information from the PCA object. So let's see what they have. Um, okay, so we can just see in general what does this object have. 
Well, they have explained a uh, variance ratio. So that can tell us uh, the amount of information explained and maybe we can plot that. So you can see, uh, there is a curl. So there is a, a quick jump in terms of percentage uh, of um, variance explained. So with one component, um, I guess, um, I guess it's, uh, what are the values? Oh, so like basically this one uh, already captures uh, maybe like 60%, just one of them. And then you can add the other ones. Um. And let's see if there's something else that could be useful to us. You can get precision, so you can most probably get what, what your approximation uh, is with a uh, uh, number of components. And um, the other things I have not used, they're more like uh, uh, details. Okay, so the main thing is to get this object, which uh, we uh, obtain by fitting the transform uh, on the data and we got something called X transformed. And the shape of X transformed is um, 10,000. This was the uh, 10,000 uh, is the number of observations we have. And this is our new dimension, but that is still large. So let's reduce it because I did, uh, so let's make it 30 again, the way we started from the beginning so that we reduce the dimension. So now X transformed is 10,000 times 30. So this is the, the reduced dimension. So each, each uh, new observation uh, is in a 30 dimensional space. And uh, let's try to, uh, to look at uh, what patterns we get. So in the next function, uh, we um, we look at PCA components. So the shape of PCA components is, what is the shape of PCA components before you run it? Can you say it? So we have number of features about 7,000 times number of observations about 10,000. Um, 10, We have a one matrix that is 10,000 times 30, and we have another matrix that is 7, about 7,000 by 30, yes. So the shape is, um, I don't know why we got 3,000. Oh, I think I reduced the dimension somewhere. Um, I think I limited the frequency. So anyway, the new, the new number of features is about 3000. So X, X is um, 
10,000 by 3,000 for what we start with. Okay, so I reduced a little bit the number of features by cutting off some of the frequencies in the spectrogram. Okay, so let's visualize them. And in order to visualize them, we have to reshape them back, right? Because now everything is a long vector, so it's a little bit uh, irritating. So in this next function, what I'm doing, so each, so each of these um, components can be reshaped back to the original shape of the spectrogram, right? Because the number of features it has is 3,000 something. So if we know the dimensions, we can reshape it back and we can visualize it. So, and I do that in this uh, function here. So basically, um, I have the dimensions, uh, I think one of the dimension was 30 and the other dimension is found automatically. So you don't need to know the two dimensions to get back. All you need to know is one of them. And uh, when I reshape each component, I'm gonna call it a U and I'm gonna plot it and see uh, what they look like. So this is an example of the first 10 components. And you can see that, I mean, ideally we would want to get one component corresponding to well calls and maybe all other components being uh, not important or something like that. But with real data, there's always more going on in the spectrograms. So you see there's a lot of layers that come in the future and most probably they contribute to the patterns in the data. Uh, but also the, the well calls kind of are not together. So we have actually several components that look like some sort of call. And they might be the same type of well, they might not be, uh, I don't know actually. <laughs> but I guess the idea is that with this method you can get some patterns in your data it's not gonna be like a classification problem, right? Because you don't have really like two categories. So it's unsupervised. So you have, uh, you have patterns, but uh, in the end you can see where these patterns occur in your data, but uh, it's gonna be a combination of several patterns that are similar and a few that are kind of um, um, different. And Um, so these are the components, but we also, you remember that we projected our data on this 30 dimensional space. So what can we do with this? Well, maybe we can even go further and we can project it on two of these components and we uh, can see what it looks like. So maybe if I pick uh, one of them to be corresponding to a pattern that has like a call, then maybe I'll see where my points, um, uh, which of the points um, have that call or don't have that call. Okay, so let's do that. So, so this one, let's, let's pick one that's strong. I'll pick this one. Um, so this would be six, so it's component number seven, but uh, it is um, it is the sixth uh, element of this array, and I'll leave this as a background. Maybe this is the background, the first component. Maybe it's a background. So now I'm just looking at my data um, projected on this on the on this component and on that component. So it's going to be two dimensional, so I can actually plot it out. And let's see how it's gonna look like. I actually don't know. Okay, so what am I doing here? Just to explain. So I got my data. Uh, they are now, um, so I'm just plotting the points uh, along these two dimensions. And I also have the labels. I didn't use the labels to generate these patterns, but it's too useful to uh, to plot the labels with the right color to see whether the pattern of the label matches uh, the point clusters. So I'm just gonna look it to, to see whether there's some block of well calls or something like that. Well, and as you see, it's kind of hard to really, um, you know, like 
decompose them because it was like 3000 dimensional data sets, but we just plot it on 2D. But on the other hand, we see that, uh, you know, on this side, we don't see any well calls. So at least we learned that within this direction, if you're further on that side, there is no call, okay? So that we learn something, here it's gonna be hard, here is a mess, we we'll see both of that. But at least we can use this as maybe some sort of cutoff or something like that. Okay, so that this kind of picture often happens when you try to get some data set that is very high dimensional, you project it on 2D and there is a big block and it's a little bit hard to disentangle things. So don't be discouraged when you see this. Um, first, um, you don't have to, for your next step of processing, you don't have to use the two dimensions only. It's just our eyes are limited by seeing in 2D and 3D. So we wanna look at it, then we are kind of limited by that. But you can still use maybe 30 components and do uh, other operations on this data and you can find clusters, although you don't see it. So this is just because we're limited by our uh, eyes. And uh, second there, so like PCA is a linear method, but then there are some nonlinear methods that might be capable of uh, disentangling the data a little bit better. So we'll do one example of a nonlinear method. There are many methods and you can see that once you allow for more complex um, uh, projections, so like linear projection is limited by, um, by your geometry, but once you allow nonlinear projections, you can kind of uh, make your data look the way you want it in some sense. So this is something to be careful once you go with nonlinear methods. The degrees of freedom are way bigger, so sometimes you can find patterns that are not there. So just something to keep in mind. So I would always first try to do a linear method, like PCA, and see if there is something, and if not, gradually try to uh, a little bit loosen the degrees of freedom. So I'll show you one method to do that, uh, but there are several methods. Um, oh, okay, so this is just something I'll share with you that if you have data that looks like that, uh, it's nice to plot also. Um, so here I don't see really if this is meaningful or not, but if I uh, plot also the spectrogram at, my, at every point, then I can maybe capture some patterns. And this you can do it with any sort of data. If you have a profile, you can plot a profile uh, next to your point. So it doesn't need to be a two-dimensional data. So, so I'll just run this. Um, something broke. We rear something got rearranged. Oh, okay, I think I know. There is a book that I created by trying to flip the, the So this code, first of all, just to say that it's not my code, I stole it from uh, Psychic Learn. So if you need it, you can use it. Uh, there is an example which is called plot embedding in the, in the L. So, um, so in general, I more or less copy and paste it, this thing. And what happens when you copy and paste and something gets... That's what I was trying to do, but I think now I'm trying to just remove this flipping and just get the brackets in the right way. So this should be part of this. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so this just created the function, but as I'm saying, this function was available for people to use uh, on the scikit-learn help. And um, 
what it is doing is just kind of plotting your original data together with the point. So it's kind of uh, useful. And it might take a little bit of time. So now we can kind of uh, look at the patterns and see whether they make any sense. And at least kind of just visually at first look, we see that the color scheme kind of gradually uh, changes, uh, right? Like we see that these are more yellow. These have some purple layer here. Um, these have vertical things and I think, let me see, because it's easier to see from here. So like here, we see a cluster of calls on this side. Might not be easy to see uh, on the screen, but there's some layer of these uh, being clustered along this line. And then there's a lot of artifacts on this edge. So that I think still, uh, pretty good for, given that we just use the raw spectrogram as a big vector, right? We didn't really say anything about geometry, but it captures the different uh, patterns uh, in, the, in the spectrograms. Yes? So this the small images of the raw spectrograms superimposed on the Yes, and we don't plot them, all of them, Kind of the function makes sure that if you plot all of them it's gonna overwhelm your plot so that actually that long function is making sure it just plots or at least some of them in the in the middle and you can kind of investigate this a little bit like we just picked two components right and it wasn't clear which one was which so i think i picked this one and uh, i think uh, we can try like a, so I think in this case, I'm doing the first two, but uh, maybe I want to do, um, maybe I want to do, um, the first two seem like more like a background thing. So maybe I'll do six and seven. Let's do six and seven. Mm, broke something again. I think I know what it is. So does this make sense in general, like that you can change which, which, uh, what your axis means? So you can select each one of these patterns that you get to be one of your axes and hopefully find some patterns. So this one I did um, six and seven and six look like, oh, seven look like it had a call. So in this case, I think it shows the calls uh, more separated. So 
seems like a long this direction. So anyway, this is uh, kind of exploratory, right? Uh, that if we didn't have labels, uh, which for uh, originally, uh, before the welder team started working on uh, the welder app, there is no annotations for the data uh, in the OI observatory for the hydrophone data. So all you could do is kind of just grab that and try to visualize it. And, uh, but now that even if there are labels from some other data sets or if you generate some crowdsource labels, you can actually use them. Okay, so I'll show you and just for simplicity, if you wanna do a lot of pairings, uh, you can use the scatter matrix function in Python. Um, so you don't have to like generate your own uh, five million combinations of this variable and this variable, this variable, and this variable. So that's just something useful if you want to look for patterns this way. So how are these functions running on your laptops? Is it slow? A little bit slow for me, but I mean, eventually they go through. So yeah, this is sometimes if you have like, uh, uh, if you have several variables and if you want to find the kind of the patterns between variables, it's kind of useful to just look at all of them. And uh, I mean, I think on this dimension, I can see that clearly on the left side, on the left side, I have uh, calls and on the right side, I don't have. So along this direction, I can use it as some sort of cutoff or something like that. Okay, and some of them are just like a jungle. So you cannot figure out what's going on there. Okay, so let's do an example of a nonlinear method. Um, and uh, one of them is called Chisney. And um, basically the format in, um, in Python is very similar. You just basically uh, use a different method. And what the Chisney method is looking at um, kind of local um, distances between observations. So it has way more degrees of freedom of like finding patterns between uh, neighboring points. So uh, it looks at the kind of the space around the points and finds uh, kind of neighbors. So it's uh, slightly different than uh, just uh, projecting your data onto like uh, a new plane. So the method comes from uh, um, the scikit-learn manifold module. And there you'll find a lot of other ones. So this is not the only nonlinear method. It became popular like a few years back because to some extent, um, some of the older methods were very slow to run, first of all. And second, uh, because it look at, looks at this local structure, you can actually find meaningful patterns from the data. So people started using it. Uh, so, but I can still show you that uh, there's many methods, so you shouldn't be limited by them. And actually the, the scikit-learn tutorial is pretty good in terms of explaining uh, with some very specific patterns what these dimensionality reduction methods are doing. So for example, if your data lies on like a sheet, so you can capture those relationships with certain methods and you might not be able to capture them with other methods. And um, so, uh, so, and there's example for, for each method. And, um, but as I'm saying, uh, we'll just use one of them. And this is an example where I stole the function from, but I think it's pretty good. Um, so let's use Disney, as I'm saying, in the end, it's very similar. Uh, they've made the, the syntax very similar that once you do PCA, you can just swap it and kind of run a new method. So what we do is the same thing. So we just import, then we specify how many components we want. I'll specify here two because this method is uh, way slower than PCA. So we'll have to wait a little bit. And I guess here I have also limited to only 10,000 uh, because maybe I was worried that it's gonna take a lot of time. But maybe I can even make it smaller so that I just run it the first time. And then we can try it with a bigger number. So let's just look at a, a thousand points. Uh, but the format is very the same. Uh, in the end, you get the points and you can plot them on a 2D plane. And you can plot your labels. 
So let's plot them. So we see some uh, very different patterns than what we used to see. And a lot of the, the yellow points kind of got clustered together. Although some of them are pretty good, but capture a lot of them kind of natural. And this is only a thousand points. So let's try now 10,000. I just want to make sure it runs. So let's do one more 10,000. So as a next um, exercise, I want you to try something on your own. Uh, so there is one parameter in this method, which is called perplexity. And I want you to try uh, putting different values in, uh, in this parameter so that um, uh, you see how these patterns change, right? Because ideally, if there is a pattern in your data, you don't want your, uh, by tuning some parameters of the methods to get different results. So let's do a few tries and see what you find. The good thing about PCA is that there are almost no parameters there, right? Um, it's kind of, um, it, it gives you the same answer every time, uh, most of the time, unless there's some numerical error or something like that. While with these other nonlinear methods, they have actually parameters in them. So this is something to take into account. So maybe you try a few values for the, for the perplexity and to get help on the function uh, you can just uh, write help is me So the default is 30, but I want you to play with a few values. Uh, and then if you find something interesting, let us know. If not, it's okay. Yes. Uh, so you couldn't read it for the second notebook at all. So when you started the second notebook, you didn't, you couldn't even read it. Did you run the first notebook to the end? So it says it saved. Let, let me check.
Some of you, uh, before we ended, um, shared with me that they tried uh, perplexity one, and that gave them that uh, kind of like well distributed circle. And they also said that they tried a hundred, and that dispersed the points. I suspect. Um, so I guess the main message is that there are specific things about this method that are important. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes. Um, uh, for example, if you have like a big cluster, that doesn't mean anything because it just uh, cares about local distances, like relative distances. So just because it looks big on your screen doesn't mean it's a big cluster. It doesn't mean that one cluster is bigger than the other cluster. So it really cares about uh, relationships between points, but the sizes and the shapes are not uh, that important. So this is something just to keep in mind when you use these methods. You know, sometimes they can show very good patterns, but um, just be aware. And there are some guides of how to, um, to avoid some of these pitfalls. So I'll stop here with the, with the uh, kind of unsupervised uh, methods. Uh, during the break, Felipe also suggested that I should use a HV plot for my plots. So I guess I'll have to update my, um, all my uh, uh, plots, but that's a good idea actually for these visualizations where you have a lot of points uh, on top of each other. You use some of these interactive plots so that you can zoom in. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to make the label color, but that's just something to, uh, to uh, keep in mind. Okay, so I'll go into the third notebook, which is now uh, focused on doing supervised learning. So we're gonna use the labels that we are given. And um, so let's go here. So this is a classification notebook. So we're gonna do the same thing, just gonna load the first cells to get the same data into this notebook. And yes. Let's do this one. I have 85. Too many laptops. Okay, <laughs> it's confusing to me. <laughs> um, okay, so I think one of the important things is when you approach um, uh, a classification problem is to organize your data so that you you are ready to to run some of these experiments and. Um, Kind of the main, uh, the main rules are that you have to have a way to train your methods and you have to have a way to evaluate your methods. So you cannot jump in and look at all your data because you need to actually take some of this data you have and put it aside and not touch it, not look at it. Um, because uh, if you start looking at all the data from the very beginning, you already are biased in some sense. So for that kind of the main rule is uh, kind of different ways to do this, but the main idea is that you have to have some sort of testing data set that you take and put aside and don't touch it, you don't look at it. And you don't do PCA on it because uh, already doing PCA on it is you learn something about this data. And then kind of um, once you have the leftover, you can do with this, with this data set whatever you want. You have the freedom as long as you have good strategies to to uh, utilize this freedom so that you don't fool yourself uh, later on. And uh, for now, we'll just do a simple example in which we uh, split it two more times. So one more time, we split whatever was left uh, into a training set and what I call validation set. So basically, we will train a method on this part and we'll test the performance on this part. And uh, so we can do this many times so that I can compare different methods. So one would give me this score, another one would give me another score. Uh, but uh, once I want to test on the uh, data set that I left out, I'll only, I'm only allowed to do this once and then kind of share with the public what the score is. You're not allowed to, to change your mind and go back, look at this one, 
and go back and change more methods. So th this one is the one that you can play with, uh, but this one is the one that you just test it out. And in reality, you know, like usually you don't really have one fixed data set, right? You, many of you have streams, you can have access from data from the servers. So the idea is that this would be the data that um, might be coming in the future. So you need to have a method that can work on this uh, data so that you, you, you won't have labels to check and come back. So you better work well the first time. Okay, so this is kind of the setup. And uh, if you remember in the beginning, I just took 10,000 observations from my data set because um, it was a little bit big, but in this case, I already have 20,000 observations that I can set aside. It's kind of big in general. Usually you wanna get as much as training data, but in this case, I just put it aside because I don't wanna overwhelm the computer. In general, you use as much as possible uh, for training and you can leave a smaller data set for testing. So I have that already there. So I'm not gonna even look at this. I have not even read the data, but I wanna set up a data set that's split into training and validation. And for that, uh, we can use a function from scikit-learn, which is called um, uh, train test split. And kind of the language is usually, you know, you're gonna train on this side and you're gonna test on this side. But I decided to be explicit with the language that this is validation and this is testing. So although we'll be testing on this one too, uh, I'll be explicit in my variables that this is my validation. Uh, so it's underscore val, so that it reminds me that this is the data set I can kind of play around with, but it's not the one that I'm going to test only once. So, so and I split it like 80% of it would be my train and the other part I will do the validation on. And I run this and um, the next step would be to decide what methods to use. And we have this picture, uh, which was kind of way back, but I think still a lot of useful things come in. Yes. Uh, so, so far, uh, so I just used um, kind of, I didn't pass these extra parameters, but in this particular case, uh, what is important? Uh, we have only few uh, well calls, right? So there is a chance that um, by chance, when I split them, I might not get any well calls in my validation set. So, so sometimes people add an extra option uh, which is uh, called stratified, so that uh, you basically, your, you preserve your, the ratio of the labels gets preserved in your split. And in this case, you ensure you, the distribution of your calls and non-calls is more or less the same. So, and that's kind of an extra parameter uh, of the function. And actually, let's, let's go. There are a few other useful things, since kind of you are asking about this. Uh, and they're important with real data that's, uh, uh, for example, we said a lot of data is correlated in reality. So there is another option which is called group. So sometimes people are related by group. Maybe this comes from this node and this comes from this node. And maybe you don't want, like, if, if they're from the same node, uh, they're, they're kind of biased. So you want to make sure that when you do prediction, you can predict from the new node. So these extra um, parameters can allow you to have like a better uh, kind of more realistic uh, scenario so that you can test, uh, so that you don't um, kind of cheat a little bit by mistake. Uh, and these, these, these are like very, uh, this very often it's very tricky to kind of account for all these little things to make sure that when you test it, you really uh, had an independent test. But uh, these extra functions uh, come up here. So let's see what I have. So random uh, kind of shuffles it. So it also shuffles it many times. Data is, if it's time series, you might actually want to shuffle it um, so that there is no like a specific pattern. So there is stratified, uh, stratified. So this would take care of the ratio of your uh, labels within both sets. Uh, and I guess they don't have group here, but group comes in when you do cross-validation. So I'll show you 
to uh, a little bit later. So I guess this one doesn't have it. Uh, and we could do stratify here. I actually didn't do it, uh, but it might make sense. Okay, so in terms of methods, uh, although there are many methods uh, in machine learning to do classification, there is a few that are considered more like a brute force, like they work on a lot of different applications. So um, in general, uh, I would suggest to start with some linear methods, although uh, we know a lot of data is complex, but I think you should always have like a baseline that uh, applies a simple linear method to your problem, because then you can always compare to it. So, and for linear methods, some of the uh, popular choices are logistic regression, which a lot of you understand, it's kind of interpretable. So, uh, it's, um, it's something to start with, and another option is support vector classifier. So, once you've done that, maybe it's not good enough, but you don't know. So, the only way to know is to check the performance and compare with other methods. So, if you just apply one method, it's a little bit hard to say. Uh, if it's good or not, until you do some proper evaluation. And for next steps, usually you try maybe some, if, if linear method is not sufficient, you can try a few nonlinear methods. And from the popular ones uh, are random forest and gradient boosting, uh, which are both uh, example of ensemble methods. So they, they're based on trees, decision trees, but they combine different trees together. So they actually, ended up to be very, although individual trees are very weak classifiers, random forests and gradient boosting are pretty strong classifiers once they utilize many trees. Um, so yeah, these are kind of like, you know, like people use them for all sorts of applications. Somebody mentioned, several people mentioned they use random forests. This is kind of like, if I don't know what to do, I would go for random forests. Uh, but uh, often like I would just do some linear regression just to have some sort of a simple thing. To, to point to, like at least I tried so that uh, somebody doesn't ask me then and I look like a fool because maybe regression worked better um, and I didn't even try. Okay, so in this uh, example, I'll show you how to do um, logistic regression and then um, maybe uh, you can do by yourself a random forest. And usually the kind of the pipeline is more or less the same. So once you know how to do one, you can do uh, all the other ones. So in, in um, the logistic regression comes from linear module, uh, linear model, and uh, you specify a classifier like that. Usually you can pass some extra parameters. For now, we will not pass uh, anything. So we'll try to do it with the default. And uh, once you do that, you can just do dot fit and provide the train and the uh, the train data and the label. So that's kind of pretty simple. So like, even if you do so logistic regression um, takes categories as output, but traditional regression, almost everybody has tried one. It's pretty much the same. You have X and Y and you try to fit it. Okay, so the change becomes uh, a little bit, so evaluation kind of uh, changes depending on whether you use a category as output or you use a, a numerical bad. So because in categories, you have to see which class uh, was correct and which was not. Uh, and in, uh, if you just do normal regression, you have to calculate the mean squared error or something like that. So it's slightly different. So I'll go through this case for the, for the, for the, uh, for classification, because it's a little bit uh, less true, kind of, to kind of, I think normal regression is simpler. Uh, and here you kind of have to think a little bit more. Okay, so, so how do we evaluate if a method is good or not? Anybody wanna? So we, we ran it, we have something here stored in this object. What do we do next? What do we do next? Yes. Okay, yeah, so that's why we selected the data. We wanna 
see how it performs there and get some metrics. Uh, so where is our, uh, oh, okay. So before even doing that, uh, one thing is to check whether it even worked on the train data because sometimes the method might not have converged or something. So it better have worked on the train data before because it's not gonna work on the, on the validation. So in this case, I'm actually, after running it, um, I actually test, uh, if I run this function on the same data set, I test whether I can uh, predict my labels. So, uh, and this is on the train data and it better be good because otherwise I have not really, um, maybe something happened with the convergence of the method or maybe it wasn't a good fit or something like that. So in this case, I ran it and it gives me some sort of accuracy. So this is looking at uh, um, kind of uh, the, um, the difference between the predicted class and uh, a true class. And I get some score. I mean, like regression is, um, um, linear regression doesn't have that many degrees of freedom. So it's kind of, sometimes you don't get a perfect score. Um, so that's, that's okay. Most probably you can tune it a little bit more to get a higher score on the train data. But let's now try it on the validation one. So we, we really do the same thing. Oh, let's, let's move this away from here. So, okay. So basically the function is predict. And I just, um, I just pass my validation set and I compare my output to the true value and calculate the number of mismatches. So that is my accuracy. And for that, I get 0.77, um, which is lower, but not too bad, right? Uh, I mean, uh, had a little bit higher on the train set. So is that good or bad? What do you think? It's okay, livable. <laughs> Maybe now we don't get a raise, but <laughs> It's okay. Um, so what is, um, um, what can we use as baselines here? What is our baseline? What could be our baseline? A random classifier, yes. So that's better, right? That looks good. Um, what is, um, so if we run a random classifier, uh, what is the chance of, uh, what would be our score for a random classifier? Um, would it be 0.5? I guess it depends how we define the random classifier. So I guess there's, I think there could be several options, right? One of them is that has a 50% chance of getting it right. Uh, one of them is that it uh, it flips a it flips a coin every time and decides on what class. Um, what is um, do we know uh, if we flip a coin every time? Do we know what score we'll get? So half of if we flip a coin, half of them would be uh, true and half of them would be false. How many of them are true and how many of them are false in our data? Do we know? Have we checked? No. So maybe we should check that first because that affects our scores, right? So, so let's do that. Uh, maybe I have a function somewhere below it. Okay, I can just check it here. So we have the y's and I want to see how many of them are equal to one. Uh, from the total number. Okay, we have 24% of them only being having well calls, which, um, which, um, in reality, it might be even lower. Like I think they arranged these data sets for us and they didn't have that many calls. But in reality, if you just listen to a stream, there's a chance that you have even low, you don't hear like a whales over and over again. So there is a chance that uh, your, um, your, uh, one of your classes has very few uh, 
um, um, occurrences than comparing to the other one. So that's something to take into account. So what's a baseline? What's an, what's another baseline in this case that we can use? Yes. Sure. I guess something to to make sure that we don't do something uh, worse than something simple. <laughs> so we don't feel ashamed. <laughs> so in this case, is there some other option? One of them is the random classifier, but what's, what's another option? If I know that I have very few uh, observations of, of something happening, very rarely what's what if i don't have any knowledge about this phenomena what would i predict zero i don't i i was told it happens very rarely i don't have any other knowledge i'll just say that it doesn't happen right so with this kind of knowledge this 24 percent we can just have a classifier that always says no right and with that, we can get actually pretty good accuracy. It's gonna be like uh, like 75%, okay? Right, because if I always say no, I'm gonna get the ones that are uh, no, at least those I'll get. And uh, I'm not gonna get any of the calls, but based on the accuracy, that's fine, right? So we are doing a little bit better than that, right? <laughs> in terms of total score. And maybe using different metrics, you know, we're doing uh you're we're not doing something so stupid right uh, but based on the accuracy itself you know we could have had this classifier that always says no and uh still have a decent score so the first rule is if you know that there's chance that your uh your uh, data set uh is um is has unbalanced classes you should be very careful with the accuracy score because that can mislead you in thinking that you're doing very well so that's uh, something to think about. Okay, so what, um, what else can we look at? Um, one thing is that, just to kind of point you to, is to, um, is to tell you that dot predict function, uh, which is here, we didn't pass any parameter to this function, right? So it's basically the way regression works. Um, Usually you have um, logistic regression works. It gives you probability and then converts that probability to a class, zero or one. So in the typical case, it can just say if it's above 0.5, it's one. If it's below 0.5, it's zero, right? So that's good, but um, there is no reason that this threshold should be 0.5, right? So we can explore other thresholds and just set kind of based on our problem that uh, we can decide on a different threshold that can give us better score. So in some sense, we have to take kind of, in, uh, we have to make sure that our data, um, our methods uh, works for different thresholds because we don't know also like um, um, for future data, we don't know what the, the ratio of those classes would be in the future data set. So one thing to, uh, to look at is how the method performs for different thresholds, right? Because we don't know which one is the best one. So let's just see how it performs for different ones. And for that, uh, people um, plot uh, basically the, the values, uh, the performance of your method for different thresholds. And that becomes the receiver operating characteristic, uh, which is a curve. Uh, on which on one side, let, let me just plot it first so that we look at it. So how many people have uh, looked at these kind of curves? So these curves uh, basically uh, plot two things. On the lower side is the false positive rate, but in English, I kind of hate the words false positive rate because sometimes it's confusing. In English, in our problem, this is the number of predicted up calls when there is no up call. So we understand what it means in our problem. And uh, on the other side uh, is the predicted up calls when uh, there is an up call. So this is what people call precision. And this is what people call recall. 
So basically from the ones that you are interested in, how many did you get back? So this is the recall. And from the ones that you said that they are something interesting in this case, uh, up call, how many did you get uh, correct? And when we look at this plot, um, this is kind of the chance line. So a random classifier would be, uh, would be represented by this line. And then um, basically the pattern, uh, kind of ideally we want to have high precision. And uh, okay, so this is actually, this is predicted up call when no up call. So we don't want to have, we have, we don't want to predict up calls when there is no up call. Uh, so this is, uh, got, it right, uh, got it wrong, so this is not the precision. So, so this is not the recall. So anyway, we want the false positive rate to be low. So we don't want to make mistakes here, right? And we want, when there is an up call, we want to get uh, these uh, up calls, right? Makes sense. So like we kind of want it to be in this corner here. I mean, ideally it never, it's rarely exactly there. So, but kind of when you look at these plots, the one that it's most to that corner, this represents a good uh, classifier. And the way these points are populated is that they get a different point for different threshold. So for example, if we have a, uh, let's look at this. If we have a threshold of zero, then we basically, um, so for everything above zero, we're gonna call it, there is a call. So this means that we're gonna get all of the calls. So, so we're gonna get this here. So this would be zero. Oh, wait, let me get it right. So when the threshold is zero, we will call everything up call. Maybe I messed up something. Well, so for sure when we have zero, uh, we will have a high false positive rate because we're gonna call all of them calls. So a lot of them will guess wrong. So I think that would be that point here. And we will get all the ones correctly that are there, but we also get a lot of wrong ones. Okay, I think that's that point. And I think if we have threshold one, then we're not gonna get any of them. So we're not gonna make any mistakes, so we'll be here. Uh, but we'll also not get any up call. So we'll be here. So that the two extremes. And anything between zero and one is on this line, sort of. So that's kind of the, that's how you create this plot. For different thresholds, you get a point. Okay, so does it make sense? I mean, you kind of have to think through the cases. But, um, but this, uh, this curve uh, is still kind of uh, a little bit, doesn't give us the whole picture because the score is 81 and it looks good. And I'll just give you another plot that a little bit explains uh, uh, what happens uh, in our problem. So I'll just go through this. I know I have to stop in a little bit, but I'll just show you this example. I'll let you go, what did I break? So let's do one more curve. So this one is actually looking at recall and precision explicitly. And in this case, we can calculate the precision uh, and the score. So the precision is 60%. So this is from the ones that I said that they are called 60% were correct. Okay, that's not too bad. 
but um, so let's look at also the recall. I'm trying to find it. Maybe I don't have it explicitly. It's in the confusion metrics. Okay. okay, so from from the confusion metrics, um, which I don't know actually why it doesn't plot. Like um, this was a traditional way of plotting and it stopped plotting properly. So I thought to put it up so that somebody tells me how to fix it. So if you know how to fix it, let me know. Uh, but basically in this uh, corner, we have that from the ones that had up call. Um, so, and uh, we, so we predicted up call and the true was only 30%. So we see that these numbers are getting smaller. In this case here, the ones that we predicted up call, um, the true label was no right up call. So we get only 0 0.007, so that is good actually. Uh, but that's, that's bad, because this one we want to be zero. So we want this matrix to be, to be a high number along the diagonal and low number of the diagonal. And this one we, we got it, and this one is too high. And this can be achieved by shifting the threshold. So that's kind of, a, this is another way to uh, decide on what your threshold can be. But um, it's also something to think about in terms of decision making, because uh, if you work with some uh, stakeholders, for example, you know, they, they may, maybe like the cost of making a mistake is, uh, one mistake is different than the cost of making another mistake. So this is also for your kind of in general for your research, you know, like there's, you can kind of make statements that mean differently, uh, although the mistake looks almost the same. So this is something to decide on your own. So there is no rule here to say like, oh, you know, like um, uh, you can look at the average, um, you can look at this average precision, but then even that, that measure, I don't think it's always meaningful. Maybe for certain problem, you want to have certain recall and within that recall, you want to have high precision. So the way you make your decisions in these problems is a little bit more complex. So I will stop here. And um, I encourage you to so uh, to kind of there is a, to try the same thing with a random forest if you just want to try a different method. And uh, basically, the function to do this is random forest classifier. So it can just help you go through the steps of calculating all these measures uh, and making sure you get it right. Um, in general, for going forward, so this problem is tricky because, as I said, the data set is not balanced. So there's a lot of things people do in order to make sure that this is not a problem. So when they do cross validation, they look at a lot of different subsets of the data. So they don't just get one validation set. They look at different subsets of, your, of the data and they uh, basically they can balance the training set but not balance the testing set so that it's a realistic um, example. So there is a lot more to, to go in to kind of solve these type of problems and they occur all the time. Like in my life, they keep on appearing unfortunately. So there's no like one solution but I think exploring all these metrics is kind of the right path. And um, so, I have like extra notebook discussing a lot of deep learning stuff. So I'll just suggest if anybody is interested, I can go in one of these rooms and I can kind of chat about what I had in mind. But because I want to stick to the time, I'll stop here and uh, I'll take some questions if you have any. Oh yeah, so there is a question on Slack about um, uh, applying uh, independent component analysis and non-negative metric factorization to, uh, to the data that we had. So these were like the two other options for doing dimensionality reduction. And one of the problems was that uh, 
for non-negative metric optimization, if you have a, uh, if, if you have a lock, you get uh, negative values. So that's kind of a problem. So it's not gonna work on the on the lock values. And if you don't if, if you don't apply uh, the lock transform, sometimes your values are very, uh, they're on different scales. So sometimes it's harder to capture the patterns. So Wujung, I think you can say maybe something about this since we thought about that yes. <laughs> for a long time. So I guess on the practical side, because um, I'm not a scientist, I, I get confused by units. So on the practical side, you can always, uh, if, if you log it and it becomes, some values become negative, you can just add uh, like uh, some uh, constants to make it positive and then apply the transform to get the patterns. So it's more like a pattern approach versus a scientific approach. Um, okay. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> um, that's a hard question. I think like the technical question is, uh, it's not as hard as like, uh, I think there's two things. One is the technical, how to really do this, which uh, people do this a lot. Like basically they, uh, you can actually store these uh, models that you even, even you get from scikit-learn. You can store the model and you can pickle it and then you can basically apply it to new, to new data. So that's kind of, that's, uh, that you can do, whether it's very efficient, it's, a, it's another question. Maybe if you wanna deploy it on some small device, then the question is whether you can install the same libraries on, on this device. But people have done this uh, and people use also like um, kind of, uh, Docker containers. So they kind of uh, make that um, everything is stored, everything that you need for your problem is stored on this container so that you can easily deploy it uh, somewhere else. The other problem is hard, how to make sure that it's gonna work as soon as uh, you deploy it somewhere else. I think there's still like this period where it's, uh, I don't know what they call it, but like not real deployment, like alpha, beta, whatever, where you'll be getting your new data and you keep on doing this, all this testing again and again and again, as opposed to like kind of um, believing that everything you've tested before is, uh, uh, it works. So I think there's always the feedback. Uh, 
unless you maybe you had like a very simple problem and you solved it and every time it works. But I would say there's gonna be some looking again at what happens. And I know people even have widgets and stuff like that to help them a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so the question was uh, how to make uh, some of these models that we just went through, how to make, how to deploy it in the real world. Sorry. Okay, so time for projects, time for lunch. And if anybody wants to talk about deep learning, come and find me. <laughs>